Hi, and welcome to A World of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders and politicians from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics, and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, and I'm an undergraduate student at Harvard University, and I'm fortunate enough to be co-hosting with Syed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Ahlul Bayt. Tonight, we welcome to the show Miss Audrey Kitagawa, the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Parliament of World's Religions, and the former advisor to the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict at the United Nations. In this episode, we discuss what we really mean when we talk about the philosophy underpinning interfaith dialogue, whether interfaith can be conceived of as a mechanism for real change or as a theological philosophy, and how the interfaith practitioner may respond to religious doctrines which are hostile to embracing other religions on their own terms. We're so thrilled to be hosting this evening Divine Mother Audrey. Firstly, before we delve into the dialectics and the mechanics of interreligious dialogue, we would love to have a sense of your motivation for embedding yourself in and developing the interfaith space and the ways in which you've done so over time. Thank you so very much, Michelle, and also to Imam Razawi for this privilege and opportunity to do this podcast. I want to be a share that uh, I pretty much grew up in the interface space and uh, originally born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, of parents who were of the Buddhist and Shintoist persuasion, which is uh, not unusual for Japanese families where Buddhism and Shintoism are considered to be copacetic religions. Shintoism is indigenous to Japan. And the very brief history is that the first emperor of Japan, Jimmu Tenno, arose from the sun goddess Amaterasu. And this immediately gave the emperor and his lineage following thereafter divine status. So one could not even look upon, if you're a commoner, you could not even cast your eyes upon the emperor. And it was not until World War II and Japan lost the war that people began to accept that the emperor was a human being. So... uh, With respect to the Japanese migration to Honolulu, Hawaii, many of them came as contract laborers to work in the fields. At that time, during the Meiji era, Japan had universal education. So many of the uh, Japanese people had some, you know, modicum of education already. Um, I would say that my maternal grandmother was probably an exception since she was illiterate. So in any event, uh, you know, over time, because we came into Hawaii in enclaves of commonality with people from Japan, and these communities were built with, uh, you know, Japanese people. So you had these huge enclaves of the Japanese people working the fields and trying to, um, you know, sustain themselves. So that in and of itself was a very interesting history. Hawaii is known to be a very multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious uh, state. It is now a, a state of the 50, is a 50th state of the United States. And you had contract laborers coming in not only from Japan, but the Philippines and uh, China, Korea. And of course, with the advent of the Vietnam War, you had a lot of people coming in from Vietnam as well. So uh, when I was little, uh, we certainly went to the Shinto shrine for specific purposes. Like every New Year's, you go there to get the blessing of the Shinto priest. Uh, The Buddhist temple was used for, or you visited, um, at least in my childhood, uh, for ceremonial purposes, uh, mostly at that time funerals. My mother was a very devout Buddhist and uh, also, but in our home, there's two altars, the altar for Shintoism and the altar for Buddhism. And many Japanese households had those two altars. They do not see it as conflicting religions at all. Uh, Then we moved 
uh, to a location where it was very convenient right across the street was a Christian church. And my mother especially believed that the children should have a strong spiritual grounding. So she sent us across the street. And so I grew up with the stories of Jesus and the First Testament and the, new, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so most of my childhood understanding of what it is to lead the good spiritual life actually came from Christianity. Then my, um, I went to a university, a private university in California that was founded by um, a Catholic, a Protestant, and a Jew. And uh, it continues to be a private university today. And then I w- went away to a Jesuit law school. So I've always had this influence of different faiths. And of course, I studied religion, philosophy, et cetera, as an undergraduate. So, and of course, when you become a lawyer, you study the U.S. Constitution and, you know, the different amendments to the Constitution. And of course, the First Amendment of the separation of the church and state. And of course, many nonprofits in the U.S. uh, have specific prohibitions against becoming political. So uh, this is a very... A wonderful background to have the diverse samplings of different uh, religious uh, communities and teachings, etc. And uh, with respect to my being the chair now of the Parliament of the World's Religions, uh, you know, the Parliament was made quite famous at its inaugural convening through the powerful speech of Swami Vivekananda, who was the beloved disciple of Paramahansa Sri Ramakrishna, who was considered by Time magazine to be the avatar of the century. So he basically uh, led the way. He said, I am the string running through all the pearls, the pearls being the individual religions, in meaning symbolically this interfaith world where we recognize the sacredness of all the different pathways to the one great God. And so there is an inherent respect for all the different pathways, knowing that the true sacred teachings would lead us to that state of understanding our our eternal immortal union with the divine. So um, this uh, Sri Ramakrishna was given to me as my chosen ideal by my beloved spiritual mother and uh, who we all called Divine Mother. And before she left her body, she chose me to now head the international spiritual family that grew up around her because she gave the most beautiful, powerful, spontaneous expositions on the divine that one could ever have the privilege to hear. And she spoke in a language that was at once uplifting and unique. I mean, I never heard such languaging of the divine in my life. And I instantly fell in love with her because she had this resonance about her that was absolutely radiant and beautiful, but what she was giving to me of what she was saying went right into my heart. So when I first met her, she said, you, pointing at me, she said, you cannot serve two masters. And somehow in my heart, I just understood what she meant. And then she launched into a five-hour, nonstop exposition on the divine. And she said such fascinating things to me, which I didn't fully understand what she was saying. But uh, she said, don't worry. She said, I am transmitting to you spirit to spirit, heart to heart, infinite to infinite, and not mind to mind. Therefore, whatever you may need of my transmissions will spontaneously arise whenever you need them. And she has been true to her word. So they do spontaneously arise when I need them. And so in any event, it seemed very natural 
with my chosen ideal being Sri Ramakrishna and Sri Ramakrishna's uh, beloved disciple, Swami Vivekananda, giving this rousing speech um, at the inaugural convening of the Parliament of the World's Religions, where he stood up and addressed sisters and brothers of America. And he had a huge um, ovation, a standing ovation for several minutes. So this kind of, uh, in, you know, history, my own personal history interweaving uh, with what I'm doing now seems to just be a natural unfolding. So um, now I'm the chair of the Parliament of the World's Religions. And of course, with that inaugural convening helped to launch the interfaith movement. And today we have a very vibrant interfaith global community. And um, I would say that that uh, inaugural convening has spawned uh, so many wonderful initiatives that model all of the different pathways coming together to engage in interreligious dialogue and more and more in common projects that speak to our activism that actually transcends any particular religion, but express, becomes expressions of our goodwill to work together, to join hands together, to create uh, this sense of cooperation and mutual engagement to address challenges. So we do not even have to get to the ideological divides, you know, the scriptural differences, but we fully understand that people of goodwill seeing a challenge must come together, work together to create solutions for the betterment of humanity. And that is what, you know, in, in a very small way, I hope the parliament will be able to express and, uh, you know, the, what I am able to share uh, within our own spiritual community as well. Mm. Thank you so much, Divine Mother, for that insight into your heritage, your life at the interplay of so many faith traditions, and so beautifully reconciled now in the work you do. Picking up on that note of inherent respect and ontological unity as expressed by the avatar, and as, in, as is indeed present in such concepts as Tawhid in Islam, Trinitarian unity in Christianity, I wanted to approach the philosophy of interfaith exchange, which you touched on towards the end. One of the prevailing critiques of the term interfaith or interreligion is that it ascribes to almost any encounter between members of different faiths and is more in that way a static phenomenon than it is a logic or philosophy with a mechanism or with a stated goal. So I was hoping to tease out with both you and Syed this logic. For example, do you think we should conceive as interfaith at all as a form of exegesis, whereby we interpret religious texts. I know towards the end, you're mentioning that we don't even need to touch that scriptural aspect, but maybe there is some sort of way to use that in, in interreligious dialogue. Or do you consider it more through a secular lens of mutual toleration, of non-interference, in the same way you might multiculturalism? Or are you fine, for example, with it being broad stroke, the sum of many contextually dependent methods and aims? How should we think about interfaith exchange? So are you asking me first or Imam Razawi? Shall we start with you, Divine Mother? Okay. Um, rather than go into this, you know, logical uh, discussion about, you know, uh, the um, interreligious dialogue and the texts, etc., I really feel that in contemporary times what we're facing with now, um, that this kind of uh, analysis, so to speak, of uh, our religious engagement or our engagement with different religious communities, whether it be in interreligious dialogue and interfaith work, not be an academic conversation. But I think that we can recognize that various religions and teachings come with certain common morality and understanding of common morality. And that is that as, you know, and it goes to the eternal uh, perennial question, who am I? And this common morality seeks to be able to help us know uh, what does it mean to be a fully authentic human being? Uh, 
And I think all the sacred texts ultimately have a common ground of understanding. And that is that God is a God of love and that we are all children of God. And, you know, this is something that we almost are born with this understanding that inherently within ourselves, in the coming from the divine source, having this divine gift of life, actually creates immediately this common ground, this common feature of a common ethic. And some would call it the voice of conscience. So we know, even as children, if we have done something that has violated our conscience, we know it instantly. And it's not as if we have gone to you know, gather any kind of PhD degree in scriptures or understanding. It is an inherent consciousness that is given to us that comes from the divine source that has given us this gift of life. And almost drilled in an inherent component of that divine life is this divine understanding and knowing that we are born with, that there is a common understanding that what it means to be good is to understand that we do not behave in a way that inflicts harm upon others. Now, the various scriptures will give expressions to these teachings. Like in the Old Testament, you have the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, etc., etc., etc. And um, the sacred texts all point to the essence of this the kind of conduct that we should embrace that would ultimately translate into our becoming better people and living in alignment with who we truly are in reality. And this is the reality, and I'm talking about a capital R, that is devoid of the sense of individuation and uh, separate identities that when we take on form and structure, we immediately begin to identify with the self as being that form and structure. And what the sacred text tries to help us to understand, that in the transcendental state that transcends form and structure and identities of any kind, is this pure essence of the divine that is pure and perfect, unconditional love. And moving from that wellspring of infinite love is what ultimately will help us to be able to address the common challenges that we see that arise out of this identification of the particularization of form and structure that creates so many of the problems that we see in the manifest world. One of the powerful things that my spiritual mother told me, she said that the mind is not real, only God is real. The body is not real, only God is real. Everything that changes is not real, only God is real. Everything in the external world changes. And so that's a very powerful statement and I, you know, in, in my own uh, delving deep within myself, I have had the direct experience of her transmissions to me. And I can say very truthfully that I have authenticated through my own personal experience the truth of these transmissions. And of course, um, how the, these become self-authenticating, you know, evidentiary experiences is the fact that I have experienced them. So, <laughs> but when you consider, um, when she said everything in the external world changes, you know, you have, like Lord Buddha would say, that life is impermanent. Of course, anything with form and structure must go back to dust. 
and everything in the external world changes. It's not ever the same. So you're living in a state of dynamism and constant transformation in the external world. But Lord Buddha also said that it is our attachment to what we want to hold on to that actually causes the suffering. And if we understand that part of the spiritual discipline and practice is non-attachment, that we have to be able, willing to release and let go of the things that we hold on to as me and mine and have the desire to keep the things that we want to hold on to out of our attachments and know that everyone must experience the letting go because everything is in this state of dynamic flux. So this is ultimately the sacred teachings do already say these things in different ways, but they are helping us to always move to the deeper reality, the higher consciousness, as we learn how in this sacred journey of life, we move through the ever external changing world in form and structure, but in the back of it, knowing that part of the sacred journey is to come to the state of awakening, that we are more than form and structure, we are one, eternally one, with the immortal, eternal source that has given us this gift of life. Mm. And that we do not perish when the form and structure goes back to dust. That we are actually far greater than what we have spent so much of our time in the identification of the particularizations that ultimately themselves transform. Mm. So some would say that as resonant as this is, this sense of commonality of admitting of the metaphysical unreality of everything that is not God, it may in fact be desperately sparse in certain faith traditions or certain theosophies or relegated as a priority. And indeed, there may be a stringent sense of iconoclasm or a consideration of the other as blasphemous. If you think, for example, of takfir, how do we confront that which is adverse where that common good is perhaps not the foremost priority and where this seems to be potentially the most salient context in where, in which interfaith can operate. So one of the other critiques being that interfaith sometimes may seem a bit like preaching to the choir, but how do you actually turn the heart of those who don't already believe that that unity exists within their faith tradition or would prefer to believe in such iconoclastic conceptions? How do you confront, how do you reconcile with that tension? Thank you very much for your question and I must say I've learned a lot in the last 20 minutes or so that we've been together. It's always a pleasure to be with the Divine Mother and to share with her wisdom and the way that she does it is so beautiful. Um, coming to your question and again I, I'm not as eloquent as the Divine Mother is um, but what I will do is just from my own perspective I find that interreligious dialogue or interfaith is something which is necessary. I feel that in, as a product of the 20th century, what we found was that there was a separation, complete separation of religion, and in fact, a downplay or downgrade of religion. And then what you also find is that certain religions are quite exclusive. And one does find that within um, some of the major religions, uh, there are tendencies in particular conservative circles to be exclusive. However, how do you live in a world which is so cosmopolitan in many ways, and at the same time in a world which has come together to a global village without knowing one another? And I find that today people don't know one another. Um, and I guess you find so much tension um, that it takes for the religious communities really to start dialogue. And if this dialogue started 100 years ago, I feel that it's the best platform to start dialogue, to bring people together so that we can understand one another. I find that human beings fear what they don't know. And because of this fear, it leads to misunderstandings, 
which ultimately leads to takfir, as you've mentioned, leads to wars, bloodshed. It's the fact that I don't understand my neighbor. How do I begin to understand my neighbor? Well, let's talk. Let's have a dialogue. Let's come to know one another, the human touch. You mentioned theology. There's space for theological dialogue within interreligious dialogue. There's also space, I feel, for scriptural reasoning. And for the last 10 years or so, you've seen people coming together to study scripture together. Um, and that's passages from all, all types of scriptures to look at the commonalities. What do our common scriptures say? And I found that 99% of the time, we actually are saying the same thing, but from a different lens. And why is this? Well, essentially, to go back, the absolute is absolute. For the absolute to make the other requires a huge change. As absolute, as absolute existence, for you to make something else means that you've actually taken yourself to a different position. And within, I guess, within mysticism in Islam, they use the term ta'ayun, which basically means delimitation. God delimited himself or herself. God is a gender, the absolute being in and of itself, delimited and then manifested. And then from there, you have different levels of reality which are created. Existence, therefore, is of different grades. It's more dense the closer you get to God, and it becomes less dense as you go towards creation of the physical world. The reason why we suffer in the physical world is because of the limitations of matter. You've been confined, but your soul is absolute. Is there a bifurcation? I don't think so. Your soul in and of itself is a manifestation of the divine, and it's been created absolutely. Your desires are absolute and your wants are absolute, but you're restricted. And the minute you become restricted in anything, you start to suffer. And so therefore one finds is that human beings do suffer. And because of this suffering, I guess, and because of the fact that we are restricted, what one finds is that we find chaos. And also what we find is that from suffering leads to pain and wars and trials and tribulations that humanity faces. And all of these things are moving, they're in flux and they're changing. The one thing is, is that we as a humanity are one and we're stable. And there is an essence because look, if there's 7 billion of us in the world, each one of us has taken from existence to become existence. And that absolute existence is God. But because God in his absolute sense required manifestation for this physical world to come into play because you're delimiting God, what one then finds is that as children of God or as as the image of God, Each one of us is a different image, is a different reflection. And for us to truly understand the absolute requires also for us to begin to understand one another. Because we may have a particular image of God, but somebody else has another dimension that we don't understand. This is why I do find sometimes that when scholars do sit together and they study scriptural scripture together, what is known as scriptural reasoning, the same text, so to give you an example, you've got the Old Testament which is holy to both Jews and Christians. And when one verse of that, you see one perspective from a Christian side and one from a Jewish side, it really tells you that there's something more than just one dimension. And because we are so diverse as humanity, we do require to come together to converse, to talk to one another. Because ultimately speaking, if truth, the absolute truth is one, and that is the divine. And everything else one could say is Maya in many ways. Maybe, an, as we say, an illusion. Um, God is real. Everything else perishes. And this is why there's a verse of the Quran that says that only the face of God remains. Everything else perishes. But what does the face of God really mean? Now, for a Muslim, God doesn't have a face in his absolute sense because absolute is absolute horizontal and vertically. So you can't delimit something. But what the face of God really means is a face gives recognition. And we find that those people who are spiritually inclined or spiritual masters are essentially faces of God. And the reason being is this, because when the divine flows, you come to recognize God through that person or that entity. They become a medium for you to understand God, the love of God to come to you. So to give you an example, what is Jesus essentially? When Jesus is giving this love and he's standing on the Sermon on the Mount and he's expressing really a worldview of how human beings should be 
in how we should behave. What is Jesus really giving? Jesus is giving an element of the absolute divine to humanity. And so in this way, we come to understand the divine. For if it wasn't for these people who act as a medium, we would not understand truly what the absolute is. And so to come back, religious, I think, interreligious dialogue or interfaith dialogue is extremely important. What you find is that diversity comes together, multiplicity in a state of unity. And I feel that that's very important. So to have these dialogues is important. Now to come back to, for those people who say, what's the purpose? Well, the purpose is that I'm developing friendships. I'm coming to know myself. I'm exploring. I'm becoming a better person. Sometimes it requires for the individual to become a better person, then to change humanity. There's no point in us being deficient and empty. What are you going to give somebody when you yourself are empty? So actually, it's beneficial to me. And because of that, I can then become a more wholesome person to benefit other people. Now, when others see that it's benefiting a particular individual or a particular group of people, there's an inspiration there. To take it forward, what we found in this COVID period is that religions have come together to do seva, to do mitzvah, to do selfless service for other people, which is really the foundation of what religion is. It's the idea that we share in the divine by sharing. God gives absolutely. And we shouldn't be human beings who think to ourselves that, look, we're giving something to someone for wanting something back. What religion teaches us is selflessness. And when we become selfless, we start becoming divine. So I do believe that there is a huge scope. There is this what we call virtue ethics. Each one of us really believes in virtue. To give you an example, kindness is good. God is kind. We have it innately. You see a child maybe two years old, maybe three years old, when they're together playing, you see acts of kindness and you can feel that they're feeling happy. And for example, when a child lies or does something which he or she shouldn't have done, they feel guilty. And we know lying is bad, cheating is bad, but love is good, compassion is good, giving is good. Ultimately, what are you doing? Whether you believe in God or not, whether you're an atheist or you're monotheist or you're a polytheist, on a daily basis, you're enacting the image of God. When you're kind, when you're compassionate, your existence is telling you that actually there's a divine. Whether you believe in it or rationalize it, doesn't make a difference. I think it comes from the heart and you're actually enacting God, which is very important. So yeah, there may be people who say, oh, you're preaching to the choir, but I think that this choir is making some wonderful music and they're doing some wonderful work. They're helping people. And I think that's the only way forward. That in places where you find conflict, It's been the religious communities who are willing to sit on a table, to talk, to build trust. From trust comes hope. And when you have hope, then I feel you have everything. Catching this conversation then, Divine Mother, in terms of your experience as former advisor to the Office of Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict at the United Nations, Did you find an explicit space for interreligious dialogue mitigating the most violent excesses of, for example, armed sectarian conflict? Or is it just that the grasp of divine unity was the fount of your own conviction, but not necessarily an instrument per se? Because what I'm hearing so far is that interfaith is a revelation of an a priori understanding of virtue. But what is there to do when that that same understanding, that same grasp, doesn't exist within the other that you're encountering, where their heart isn't turned towards trying to reveal that same revelation. So yes, thank you very much for, you know, your uh, segue into this whole aspect of, you know, my experience at the United Nations as an advisor for the Office of uh, Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. So therein you have a particular context. And, but we have to understand when we see a lot of the conflict that's unfolding, it really goes to this whole aspect of what Imam Razawi was speaking about, which is this virtue of ethics. And I, I just love the term virtue ethics. So a lot of these now, I would say that warfare also over the years has changed from state on state kind of conflict. Now you have, you know, asymmetric warfare in many situations where you have non-state actors, you have, you know, rebel groups, you have these different non-state actors who are in conflict with each other. And with respect to, for example, now you take the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has been uh, in, you know, 
historically in a lot of conflict, um, you will see that a lot of the conflict arises over the richness of the resources. And, uh, you know, different groups, uh, and as well as uh, states, wanting to have access to the resources, as more and more uh, people, I mean, groups and states see access to resources as primary to the security interest of the group or the country. So um, I'm, I'm having in mind the particular situation of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And Kofi, so former Secretary General Kofi Annan had said the difficulty with Africa is its richness, meaning its resources. I mean, everything that people hold treasure in the material sense of, you know, platinum, uranium, gold, um, oil, uh, you name it, the Congo has it, diamonds. So it has become a, a country, um, and you can look at the oil resources in the Middle East. So the conflicts arise there because of many different actors trying to claim access, primacy, and control over the resources to be able to have the dollars to perpetuate what they want to be able to accomplish, but primarily is to secure their own self-interest and stake to the resources. Now, what ultimately happens is that the people on the ground, the people living in communities are the ones that suffer and they become very marginalized and they become actually the so-called collateral damage, the victims of these armed groups. And uh, I, I saw that, um, you know, when you have these armed conflicts, a lot of children were involuntarily conscripted as uh, child soldiers to be able to facilitate uh, these warring factions. So people really, really suffer on the ground to be able to serve the interests of these different groups that want to protect the resources uh, for themselves. And so what we find is that when these processes of conflict occur, uh, you know, the religious communities have in many ways stepped forward to assist in addressing these conflicts. Now, it is important to have the state enter into the legal instruments uh, that would ultimately, you know, bring peace accords or enter into agreements of settlement with these different uh, competing factions. But in the meantime, you know, people on the ground have come to understand that as more and more corruption takes place, more and more failed states take place, um, that we are left, civil society is left to be able to step up into the shoes of responsibility and they have to come forward and take care of each other, address these issues on their own and find solutions. So I wanted to give uh, an example of, um, you know, like the Nobel laureate, uh, Lema Gobowi, who received um, the prize, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 for her work in leading a women's peace movement that brought an end to the Second Liberian Civil War. And uh, she shared the prize with two other women, uh, her fellow uh, Liberian, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who, was, who became the president of the country, and uh, Tawakol uh, Karman from Yemen. So these were conflict countries. The three women shared the Nobel Peace Prize that year. And in recounting Lema's uh, story, you know, she was born in central Liberia and she was living with her parents and sisters in the capital of Monrovia when the first Liberian civil war came to her doorstep. And these are her words. Uh, she said, all of a sudden, one July morning, I wake up at 17, she's 17 years old, going to the university to fulfill my dream of becoming a medical doctor and fighting erupted. So witnessing the effects of war on the Liberians, she decided to train as a trauma counselor to treat former child soldiers. And then the second civil war broke out 
in 1999, and you know, rape had become a weapon of war. So the brutality and the raping of the women as weapons of war, with a country that already had, you know, prior history of conflict. So Lema decided that she was going to mobilize an interreligious coalition of Christian and Muslim women and organize the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace Movement. So through her leadership, thousands of women, and I, and I stress the women again, because I firmly believe that women will become powerful agents of transformation for a better future. So they stage pray-ins, nonviolent protests, demanding reconciliation, and the resuscitation of high-level peace talks. And this pressure pushed President Charles Taylor into exile and smoothed the path for the election of Africa's first female head of state. And that was uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who became the president. And what Lema demonstrated was the power of social cohesion and relationship building in the face of political unrest and social turmoil. And she uh, speaks internationally now, advocating for women's high-level inclusion in conflict resolution. So the role of women I would want to put on the table today is absolutely critical to peace processes. And when you think of the women, they were mothers, and they did not want their children to have to suffer as they did in the throes of conflict. And when she was asked how she found her courage to become a peace activist, because peace activists, people who are trying to create transformation, offer suffer very greatly. And she said, when you've lived true fear for so long, you have nothing to be afraid of. I tell people I was 17 when the war started in Liberia. I was 31 when we started protesting. I have taken enough dosage of fear that I have gotten immune to fear. And it is time to stand up, sisters, she said, and do some of the most unthinkable things because we have the power to turn our upside down world right. And, you know, I remember watching Lema on the Tyler Perry show one evening, and I could see that she was a woman of deep faith. She was able to quote the Bible. And one of the passages that she quoted that really struck me was from 2 Timothy 1.7 from the New Testament. And it said, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And Imam Razawi had spoken earlier about fear. And this fear actually comes about, I would pause it today, from this sense of self-identification that has alienated you from your connection and understanding of your true reality, that you are, you know, a like my spiritual mother said, you are a perfect child of God, immortal, eternal, and already in God's light already in God's light. So this is this loss of the remembrance of our true nature that causes fear, that causes this aspect of needing to not only have self-preservation and to you know, give rise to self-interest, but also gives rise to this hierarchical structures of, like uh, Imam Razawi had spoken earlier, the exclusivity in religion. So what this unfolds is the processes that actually creates marginalization, where you can then create a narrative of dehumanization. And then because you're the enemies that you create are no longer human beings, that you can take the next step to, with impunity, eradicate them from the face of the earth because they are no longer people.
So these processes that we have seen over and over again throughout the march of history of what happens when you lose your remembrance and connection to the divine source that is, from my own direct experience now, pure and perfect, unconditional love. You do have this fear set in. You do have the structures that speak of hierarchy, exclusivity, and then you forget that we do all come from the one great source, that we are this actual aspect of separation is the illusion, and that all of life's teachings and the sacred journey is help us to remember our connection and the essence of who we are as coming from that divine and sacred source, the absolute, as Imam Razawi had mentioned earlier. So when you understand that within the hands of civil society, the common person who rises up into the steps of, into the shoes of responsibility and takes a stand to speak truth to power, that we have to help each other to create the processes of peace, to stand for peace, to stand for our love for each other, our caring for each other. The power of one person to be able to do that and create mobilization that can actually create change that goes from grassroots civil society stepping into the shoes where states have failed and encouraging this processes that puts pressure, that brings to bear these peace processes and understanding that ultimately can take people, countries, and ourselves out of conflict. Mm -hmm. But I want to also mention that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, very importantly said that we have to develop the inner values and the qualities. And this is the virtue of ethics that Imam Razawi was speaking about, where we all appreciate others and we move towards our natural selves, which is warm heartedness, uh, affection and concern for each other. And he said in a single word, compassion. So he said the essence of compassion is a desire to alleviate the suffering of others and to promote their well-being. So this is a spiritual principle from which all other positive inner values emerge. And we appreciate in others the inner qualities of kindness, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, and generosity. And in the same way, we are averse to displays of greed, malice, hatred, and bigotry. And he said, uh, the first beneficiaries of this assiduous discipline to train our inner spiritual lives and to inculcate in ourselves the inner values, the first beneficiaries will no doubt be ourselves. And our inner lives are something that we ignore at our own peril. And many of the greatest problems we face in the world today are the result of such neglect. And I take it from that statement that we all have a duty in order to really live in the world maximally as responsible global citizens. We each must accept responsibility for how we develop our inner lives, our inner character, and to constantly call into our lives that remembrance and con you know, connection to the divine source. And when we become better people and can actually implement and practice on our holy ground, which is where we live, then you can say that we have become better people. And if all of us became better people, then we would move from that heart of virtue that will not allow us to ever dehumanize another because I and the other is not distinct. I am one with the other. And therein is that beautiful 
principle of the unitive consciousness, the, seeming, the seamless wholeness of the one great God, as Imam Razawi said, cannot be delimited. So it is only the construction of the mind when we take on form and structure to deconstruct ourselves and our mental processes and the fragmentations of the mind and the perceptual field limited by the five senses and the five elements that our true wisdom can ultimately arise. And that is the lifelong journey and becomes the statement of our sacred journey together. And what legacy do we wish to leave behind of our brief time that we danced here upon the earth? And it will always be the development of the heart, the expression of that beautiful Sanskrit word, which we, Imam Razawi also mentioned, seva. Seva in Sanskrit means self less service, that you, in this moment in time, when you came to dance upon the earth, you gave yourself to a cause higher than yourself. And in that, your actions as an offering to the divine, into the divine hands of God, of selfless service, you give your best of yourself and you, the fruits you offer to God. So you don't have attachment to the fruits. And in that, you do not seek your own self-aggrandizement or self-edification, but it is all to the glory of God. And all praise and all glory will go to God. And these are the things that we must learn to truly be able to say that we are perfect children of God immortal, eternal, and already in God's light. And every moment that we live becomes the opportunity to live that love, share that love, be that love in every thought, word, and action. Thank you so much for those words. And I do loathe to be facile amidst the manifold gorgeousness of, of this harmonized philosophy. But of course, I had the flip side of this productive inter intra faith rapprochement, mobilization, source of religious conviction is where the essence of religion is not only forgotten, but explicitly co-opted, explicitly weaponized and mobilized against for the sake of nefarious or particularistic ends. And so the concern with interfaith may well be that these interreligious mobilizations as exemplified in divine mother's narrative exist, but by design interfaith as, as a philosophy can condemn the ends of, of co-opted types of, of movements, as I mentioned, like for example, paramilitaries in the Middle East, but they can't condemn the actual source of the ideology. They can only condemn what that ideology leads to by design. So how does interreligious dialogue, interfaith dialogue, come to terms with divergent forms of, of ideology, which may manifest for many different reasons, but may also just have these deeply unsettling ends. Thank you for that. There's something quite important um, that's been mentioned by the Divine Mother that actually answers your question. Um, and that is that when individuals start or collective groups start having conversations. Uh, we come to understand the humanness in each other, which then leads to us preventing a dehumanization process of the other. I find that when conversation begins, we don't necessarily need to agree with one another on the basis of faith or religion. We're all individuals. We all see the divine in a different light. So therefore, our individual perspectives on God will always be different. Two theologians in the same faith don't see God in the same light. But the one thing they do do when they come to talk to one another is to appreciate each other's humanity. And what conversation does do, I find, is that in the least what it will do is it will say to me that you're also human. You also have emotions. Time spent with an individual is enough for us to understand that the other has emotions, the other loves, the other is compassionate, 
we all have our problems. However, when we come to talk to one another, it's beautiful in the sense that it removes this dehumanization process that leads to genocide. If you look at genocide over the last hundred years or so, it's because we've dehumanized one another. And so if individuals are allowed to have conversations, sometimes perhaps controlled conversations, whereby we guide them in a particular, in a particular pathway, what then one finds is that something very wholesome can come out of it. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that when we talk about extremism, as you're mentioning, I find that all the world religions condemn extremism. Any extreme interpretation goes against the authenticity of faith. And I do find that sometimes it actually helps for somebody from the outside to give a helping hand so that internally we're able to, with the support of our friends, tackle extremism or fundamentalism. Again, you mentioned the Middle East. See, the Middle East, yes, it may be in many ways a religious conflict, but I think it's deeply rooted in politics, in culture. And for many of these things, it's not one lens. It's very easy to use God's name. And the reason being is this, that when I use God's name, then you can't question me after that. So the idea is God is absolute. And so therefore God's judgment is absolute. But I can't advocate for God. And for many of the conflicts that you find in the world, they're, inter they're interlinked in, in certain ways. It's like a tapestry. It's very difficult. Religion may be one thread, but there are other issues as well. It could be tribal. It could be cultural. To overcome this, however, another thing that the Divine Mother mentioned was the role of women. And when she mentioned that, I thought, looking into my own faith, that the survival of my own faith has rested on three women. Had it not been for these three women, my faith wouldn't be here today. One of them being the prophet's wife, Lady Khadija, who he himself says, had it not been for her, we wouldn't be here today. Secondly, Fatima, the prophet's daughter. And thirdly, her daughter, Zainab. This flag that you see behind me is because we're commemorating the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. The legacy of Imam Hussein was a universal legacy. If you look at some of the teachings of Gandhi, you'll see the mention of Hussein time and time again. Hussein's legacy was saved by his sister. Everything that we have today, every understanding of Imam Hussein that we have today, is because of that movement that his sister led. That she was the one who really bore down the entire empire of a tyrant through one speech, through her vulnerability. And the world may have thought that she's vulnerable, but actually she was connected with the divine. And when the divine flew through her to creation, you found that an entire faith was preserved. So, you know, many a time I think people have the misconception that Islam is patriarchal. Islam is male oriented and actually the survival of the entire faith. And when you look at the Prophet's family, it's always been side by side. 1400 years ago, that's a very big message. The emancipation of women as equals, to come together as equals, is a huge message 1400 years ago. We've only just understood that in the last 200 years. And this is why I always say to many Muslims, go and read your history. Read your history, see how things should be. Because when, when it comes to reconciliation, when it comes to peace, actually, historically, women have played a huge role because of those maternal instincts, because that they've been created in the beauty of God, more so in many ways. You know, there's, there's a mystical saying that there are two sides of God. One is his majesty, one is his beauty. The yin and the yang, or you could look at it male and female. So the beauty of God, which you find in creation, comes through women, comes through a woman, comes through a mother. And in the same way, if you look at the Quran, you open it up, right? What does God use? The first name that he uses is the merciful, Rahman, Rahma. And the womb of a mother in Arabic is Rahm. She cultivates creation 
in her womb nurtures it. And so for this reason, when you do bring a strong woman onto the table, I find, especially in situations whereby it's really tense, I do feel that it's through strong women that we can have change. And I've seen much change come about by that. So I guess it's important to have the right balance. And we wouldn't understand this many a time until we don't go delve into our faith. And sometimes it requires others, because we're mirrors of one another, for us to see, look into the mirror of the other, to really see ourselves. And so in conclusion to your question, yes, there may be wars in the name of religion. However, religion isn't being used as a tool. It's not so easy as to say faith or religion. And at the same time, when we do start talking, when we do have dialogue and conversation, then it brings the human element and that stops people from dehumanizing one another. And this is a problem that I see even today. You know, let's go to Bosnia and see what took place. Today, I fear more for Bosnia than I probably would have done 20 years ago. And the reason being is that there's no interaction between, for example, S Serbs and Bosniaks and Croatians in the sense that I remember when I was there a number of years ago, separate timing for schools. It's phenomenal when you don't get to know the other person, you're just waiting for another genocide to happen. It's important that dialogue and conversation takes place. Mm. Of course, and I am wary of time, but Divine Mother, if you had any final thoughts or insights to proffer, we'd love to hear them. Yes, may we spend valuable time getting to know the reality of who we really are. And upon that awakening, the realization that we are really love, pure, perfect, unconditional, and that we are all tasked to be able to bring that love in our everyday, seemingly ordinary lives and actualizing the reality of the living God in our lives here, now, every moment that we live through every loving thought, every loving word, and every loving action. And it sounds simple, but it's not easy because my spiritual mother asked this very profound question, can you love the unlovables? And when Jesus said, I was hungry, you didn't feed me, I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink, I was naked and you didn't clothe me, I was in the prison and you didn't visit me, he is articulating the opportunities that we have every moment that we live to be able to share that love in all these myriad of ways. And it doesn't have to be grand, but the grandness and the beauty of life is in the seeming ordinariness. And when we all understand that we are standing on the holy ground, and we have these opportunities to be expressions of that love, that kindness, that compassion, that selfless service, that becomes sanctified in its selflessness in the loving hands of God. And we can truly say that I have left behind a legacy of being that expression of love in action. And all of our activism in the world today should be such expressions of loving kindness, but in the remembrance that we are all children of the one great God.